This is my friend, Leslie Kiefer, and she's with Home Instead. And we invite Home Instead to speak uh, every year. And we haven't had her since uh, we had the, since the pandemic began. And we thought we'd um, resume these um, perhaps monthly Parkinson's caregiver, or I'm sorry, Parkinson's support group me meetings. And they're open to anyone really in our area. And we intend to highlight local resources like Home Instead. And one key reason that I invite Leslie and Home Instead to come, there's your nice face. Hi. One I invite uh, Leslie and Home Instead to come is that they provide an educational presentation. It's not a sales pitch. It's not, here's how, here's why Home Instead is great. We, I personally think that they're great, but that's not what, um, what the presentation is all about. It's very educational. And one of the topics, uh, or a couple of the topics I've asked her to speak about, which I think are very important, are how to hire a home care agency, what sort of questions you should ask, and how to hire home aides, because, home care aides because these are important questions, regardless of what agency or what individuals you might work with. And another thing um, I always ask uh, Leslie and Home Instead to talk about is the 70-40 talk, and she'll say what the heck that is, and, um, and I think you'll find it of interest. So overall, what Leslie's gonna be talking about are Parkinson's care options. Uh, so take it away, Leslie. Okay. And then Robin too, if you can just monitor if people ask questions and then. Absolutely. Okay. And I'll just interrupt as we go along. Yeah. And then as, as we go, if you have a question, just type it into the chat box and I'd be happy to answer it for you. Sounds so. perfect. Chat yeah. or Q&A, they both work. Okay. okay, great. I just wanted to thank Robin for having me back and um, just being able to give resources and education exactly about what home care is all about. And then Corey from Emeticis, she will be speaking after me about home health. So just to start off, so you, you understand the difference between home care and home health. So home care will be non-medical things and we'll go into exactly what services that we do provide and then Corey's going to talk about more of the medical side of services and also usually uh, insurance will pay for home health, whereas home care tends to be either private pay or long-term insurance. So, so I am with uh, Home Instead, and as I explained, we provide non-medical home care. So just today, we're going to just talk about what is home care, what are the services, uh, how to age safely in place in your home, ways also to prevent hospitalization, and then what's the average cost of home care, and as Robin explained, what's the process, how do we hire our caregivers, and also I'll talk about uh, pricing for some other uh, resources in the senior living space, such as assisted living and skilled nursing. So what's a good sign when somebody needs home care? Well, if somebody's routine seems to be off, so, you know, the medical bills are piling up, they might be missing doctor's appointments. When you see them, they might not be as un as kept as, you know, like their hair, or they might be a little disheveled, or just their appearance is kind of off. Um, also driving, sometimes if they, they'll get lost, or they'll have signs of depression. So those are all, and then also if you go to their house, if their house maybe isn't as clean or kept up, that's another sign that help is needed as well as losing track of medications. So Home Instead did a study pre-COVID and it was found that 86% of seniors want to stay at home as long as possible. I'm sure that that percentage is even increased now with 
some of the communities where the assisted living or the skilled, would they, when they went to, into lockdown mode, so you couldn't visit friends and family. And then 54% of seniors who live alone at home, they're more likely to get professional care than those seniors who might be living with either family members or friends. So what kind of services do home care agencies provide? So as I explained, it's non-medical. So it can be anything from companionship to light housekeeping, which could include doing laundry or vacuuming, cleaning up the kitchen, cleaning up the bathroom. Uh, but it's not going to include like large organizational projects. So not like reorganizing a garage or any of those things. Um, and also a lot of times the agencies will have a percentage of the shift that can be for housekeeping. Ours is 20% because if that's the only service that's being provided, then you would need to hire like a house cleaning service as compared to home care. Like we can help with, that can be part of the service, but it can't be the entire services that we provide. Um, so personal care, that can include bathing and dressing and also helping someone go to the restroom and then also going for errands. So pre-COVID, of course, maybe going to the hairdresser or going grocery shopping the, and, and to uh, transportation to medical appointments. That's something we can help with. And medication reminders. So either a loved one or a friend would have to set up a pill box and our caregivers can help remind the client to take the medication, but we can't actually physically give it to the client and that's because we are not considered non-medical. Also meal prep, that's a big thing. So being able to fix meals and then also we they can fix meals. Let's say they might be there during the lunchtime and then maybe the client would like them to prepare the meal for dinner as well. So they can prepare that and put it in the fridge. Leslie, do uh, this brings up a question about uh, during the time of COVID, can the aid assist with grocery shopping during COVID? So if if they are comfortable, if the caregiver is comfortable with doing that, yeah, we have still provided those services, but a lot of clients have gone to online services and delivery services that um, loved ones or friends have helped out with. Of course, thanks. Sure. So sometimes home care, there's other resources as well. So adult day programs is one. Again, these are things that are usually pre-COVID. So an adult day care program is great. So, cause you can, the people can usually go, it's usually in the daytime and a lot of them will provide meals and like different activities. So if a loved one needs to go and run some errands or wants to go, you know, have lunch with someone. So it gives that family or friend caregiver the break to be able to do that. And most of them will have, some have requirements like certain amount of days per week and then there is a daily fee for that and then home health so that's more on the medical side and Corey's going to explain those services but that's when you have a nurse come in maybe a physical therapist an occupation therapist or a speech therapist and a lot of time home health will be prescribed by a doctor after somebody has either been in the hospital and just needs a little bit more care and services, or a lot of times they'll go from the hospital to the skilled nursing, and then they'll still need help or support when they get home. And then senior centers like Avenitas, where you guys usually have your support group meetings, that's also a great place to have resources and social engagement and different skills. 
So then now I'm going to talk about just some different resources as far as the different types of communities. So independent living senior communities usually have activities where there's social engagement, but then usually there's not um, meal uh, uh, resources. So, um, and also there's usually a cost that or a monthly buy-in to actually live in, in these type of communities. So then assisted living, that's usually where more support is given and they will have, some of them have RNs on staff. Um, it's where caregivers will come in and check in with the residents on a daily basis and might even escort them down to a dining room. So the meals are provided as well. And then also the social activities. And then skilled nursing is usually when, like I said, someone's been in the hospital and then needs more care or needs to get a little bit stronger before they actually go home and also could have more medical services after they leave the hospital. And then just to give you an idea, skilled nursing these days is usually between $10,000 and $14,000 a month. But like I said, and Corey will go into more details about some of those and how home health will help with those costs as well. And then respite. So pre-COVID again, let's say a caregiver needed to go on a business trip or just needed a break or um, just, uh, yeah, so they need someone to come in and care for a loved one. So some of the assisted living communities will offer that where you can come in for two weeks or three weeks and usually it's a certain amount which will include all the benefits. So the meals and the caregivers checking in on loved ones or friends, and then also um, being able to have the RN services if that's something that the community offers. And then home care, we can do that too. So you don't, if you just wanna do it for a temporary, a short amount of time, we can help you with that as well. And then hospice care. So that's another type of service that usually if someone is chronically ill or um, just needs some more support, then that would be the hospice care. Leslie, we had a question in the chat, which is, does long-term care insurance work for any of these services? Yes, so long-term care insurance helps with um, home care. And then also it can help with skilled nursing as well. And now we think um, long-term care insurance could help with assisted living too. Oh yeah, that's correct. Yes, that's yes. Correct. yes, yes. And then, so different ways to age safely at home. So one thing that we do when we have a client consult is we do a home safety checklist. So we go through the home and we'll make sure all the appliances are working. You know, uh, the front door, there's a lock, the doorbell's working, that there aren't any rugs that are tripping hazards. And then also if someone needs more support in the shower, it might be you know, installing grab bars or if uh, going to the restroom, have raised toilet seats. So um, we do that just so to make sure everything's in working order and just give some suggestions too. And another thing we do is we suggest that there's a flashlight by the bed. So in case there is emergency, then, you know, you'd be able to find your way. And also having things like emergency contact numbers on the refrigerator. So if there's an accident emergency, then the caregivers actually can know exactly who to contact as well as a pulse, which would are like your life sustaining wishes. So DNRs and things like that.
And then what's the benefits of having home care? Well, things include healthy lifestyle. So a lot of times someone who needs home care is might be missing meals or not drinking enough. Dehydration is huge or having nutritious meals. So, you know, they're opening a can of soup or frozen meals, things like that. Um, or medication reminders. They're not taking their meds on time or the right amount. So, and also social interaction. So again, pre-COVID, you know, taking people out for exercise or maybe there's an exhibit or a movie that they want to see. So being able to engage and have, because social interaction is extremely important. And then reduces stress for family caregivers or friends as well. It's very overwhelming being a caregiver and a lot of times people get burnt out and they need a break. And then home safety are some of the items that I already discussed when we would do the home safety checklist. And then community involvement too, being able to go to events to be involved with the community. And then, so let's talk about how to prevent hospitalization again. Home care is important because following doctor's orders, as I explained before, a lot of people, if they need extra support, they might get mixed up as far as did they take their medication today or how many pills are they supposed to take or they're just forgetting. So, or following doctor's orders as far as, you know, getting out and doing exercise or things like that. And then you can't ignore symptoms. So if a caregiver is with you and you're kind of feeling off, if you were by yourself, you might just think, oh, I'll feel better tomorrow. But whereas the caregiver could say, you know, let's call the doctor or let's make an appointment. Let's figure that out. And then reduce risks of falling. So a lot of people who have fallen once will have repeat falls and making sure, like I said, there's no tripping hazard. So there's not carpets or things that are gonna um, induce falls. And we talked a little bit too about staying active physically and mentally is important. And again, maintaining a healthy diet. So having fresh food, having a variety, making sure you know, you're eating properly, which is going to help you stay healthy as well. Leslie, could you say a little bit more about what a home care agency or a home care aide can do in terms of helping people stay active physically and mentally? That sounds like sure. it would be a very important task. Sure. So staying active physically, like taking walks, um, you know, making sure that they're involved with activities that they like to do. Maybe it would be a jigsaw puzzle or could be adult coloring, something that besides just watching TV or, you know, doing things that are gonna stimulate your brain. Maybe it's a crossword puzzle or Sudoku if the person, you know, is able mentally to do those kinds of things. Does that cover it, Robin, or is that what you're looking for? Yeah, that's good. And I'm also wondering, uh, in terms of staying active physically, um, do, would a home care aide potentially exercise or take somebody for a walk or that sort of thing? Yeah, those are all things that they can do. And also, if you know they have a physical therapist, they can encourage them to do the exercises and also like standby, what we call a standby assist or standby supervision. So if, you know, somebody is trying to improve their balance or their stanima, then um, that's something that the caregiver can do as well. And I'm curious um, with 
Parkinson's disease, as you know, falls are a, a great risk. Mm -hmm. To what extent do the home care aides know about things like gate belts and other sort of assistive devices? Yeah, so all of our caregivers, when they're hired, they go through two full days, so eight hours of training. And some of that includes the hands-on training. So learning how to do those transfers and using the gate belt. So they have the knowledge about that. That's great. Thank you. Sure. So a lot of times people don't really know the difference between a private caregiver and hiring an agency. And a lot of times private caregivers, their hourly rate will be lower than hiring an agency. And the difference in that is because if you hire a private caregiver, then you're essentially their employer. So you will need to file taxes. You will need to carry some sort of liability insurance. So if there was an accident in the home, then you would be responsible for medical bills. Um, so, and then also if you have a private caregiver and not an agency, if the person is sick or has a family emergency, then you'll kind of be stuck. Whereas if you hired an agency, a replacement could be sent and then also when you hire an agency, all the employees or all the caregivers are employees of that agency. So we cover all the benefits. So um, we do all the taxes, provide you know, sick leave, vacation, all of that kind of services. And also they are bonded um, and go through extensive background checks, and we also carry the liability insurance. So if there was an accident, then we would take care of those costs. Is there any questions regarding that? Because that's a very important subject. One question we've had in the past is, how do you know if what you think is an agency is actually a full service agency versus a referral agency? Is there any way to tell who, what sort of agency you're talking to? Because I think people might not know what the difference is. Yeah, so a referral agency, basically they will be able to provide um, caregivers, like, they're kind of like what I would compare a temp agency to. So if, you know, you need someone, you go, you contact the temp agency, they find the candidate, and then they, it's like they, they're the point to put you guys together. So that's kind of the same as what a referral agency does. But then again, they're not going to take care of all the legal aspects and the um, all the liability and things like that. So is there some kind of a question that we as lay people can ask uh, an agency to find out if they're full service or a referral agency? So that would be an excellent question to ask them. Are you a full service agency or are you just a referral agency? Are the caregivers actually your employees or are you just putting people together? Okay. I wonder if one question would be, I, I liked what you said about, um, are the caregivers your employees? Mm -hmm. If the caregiver is your employee, then the agency would have to be providing a 1099, right? To right. The, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it's a referral agency, they would not be providing a 1099. Correct. Okay. More like a contractor. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. So yeah. that might be a good question to help distinguish if if you if you're unsure what sort of agency you're working with. Yes. Okay. And thank you for that. Excellent yeah. information. Yeah. <laughs> well, you gave me the tip of asking whether somebody was an employee or not. And that would be a good way to know for sure if they're an employee, if they're getting a 1099. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely. Um, we have a couple of questions. Let's see. Should you use a a full service agency in order to have your long-term care insurance pay for care? Yeah, a lot of times, actually with Home Instead, we will be able to provide the information to the long-term insurance company. So as far as, cause they need documentation about what's being done because there's usually certain what are called ADLs activities of daily living that need a lot of times there's like two out of six for different categories that need to actually be happening before a claim can be started. So uh, we provide that information and to them. So it's great because we can be the liaison and help you with that process. And, and just to add to that, um, you see on the on Leslie's slide the private hire column it indicates that so many things are the client responsibility and we did have um, a woman named Roberta who was part of our caregiver support group for a very long time and mm -hmm. so, uh, her husband passed away and uh, he had Lewy body dementia and um, she hired aides privately and it was a quite an ordeal uh, to do all of the paper she had to hire an accountant to do all of the 1099s and all the payroll tax and all of that stuff and she was able to work with the long-term care insurance but again it was just a huge hassle for paperwork and not really something that a stressed out caregiver uh, would want to do. So yeah. it is possible um, to have long-term care insurance and have private hire, but uh, the hassle, you definitely have to go in eyes wide open with the hassle factor. It sounds very complicated, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. We had a question um, that doesn't necessarily pertain to this slide, Leslie, but uh, sure. the question is about do, do home care aides, like the ones that work at home instead or elsewhere, do home care aides work with people who have Parkinson's and dementia? Could you talk a little bit about perhaps the training that's provided and- uh, Sure be special things that have to be kept in mind. Sure. So we do work with clients who have Parkinson's and we do have caregivers that have experience in those areas. Um, so something that I'll talk about next is what happens is if you want to hire a home care agency, you would set up what's called a client consult. So you would go into exactly details of what services you would need and if you know any medical conditions too like parkinson's dementia um heart things like that those are all things that would be determined or talked about in the client consult and then also our caregivers we have specialized training in certain subjects. So we do have specialized trainings that we do for Alzheimer's and as well a, a Parkinson's. So we have live trainings as well as online trainings too. And we have another question that came in through the Q&A and that is, 
do you have trouble finding suitable employees? Um, our hiring process is pretty rigorous. So when someone is submitting an application, uh, our recruiter will go into a lot of details and also they have to provide three personal references and three professional references. So, uh, and then they are fingerprinted, background checked, all of those. And like I explained, they'll go through those two full days of training. And then each quarter, we also have the specialized training or we'll pick a different topic. So they're always receiving ongoing training. Great, thank you. Sure. So when I was talking about the client consult, so we can either come to your house or if you prefer to do it virtual these days because of COVID, we can do that as well. So the client consult would be conducted by a uh, client services manager and there's no fee for that, it's complimentary. And at that meeting, like I said, we kind of go more into detail about the services that you would need, the personality of the client, and then also the schedule that you want, because we will then work with our staffing team to meet all those requirements. And then we would develop what's called a care plan. So in the care plan, it would outline exactly what services would be performed, how often, like through the shift and things like that. And, um, and then we also have what are called quality assurance visits every 90 days. So we would meet with the client as well as the primary caregiver to just kind of talk about if the the appropriate care is being reached. So sometimes if somebody comes home from the hospital or a skilled nursing, there are things that would need to be changed in the care plan as they gain strength or get better. And also the other way, let's say somebody's gonna cognitively decline or physically decline, then we would make those, we make those changes ongoing because our caregivers always would notify us if there was any change in the care. But those are things that are updated all the time. And would the, um, maybe you haven't gotten to this yet, but would the uh, possible caregivers that the staff has identified, would those caregivers potentially be interviewed either in person or via Zoom or something? So what we do is, uh, I mean, we're pretty confident that after we have these meetings that we will be able to make an appropriate match. And if for any reason, if the match doesn't work out, then we would find a replacement. So our policy is you can meet um, you can schedule an interview with the caregiver uh, virtually and Home Instead will pay for the first interview, but anything after that, then the client would need to pay for that. Okay, the first interview with, with one individual caregiver. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. And what do you, uh, um, may, perhaps this is coming, but if you could also address uh, um, what AIDS are doing in terms of COVID safety. Yeah, so um, I have a slide that I was Great. going to show at the end, but- Let's wait for that. We can okay. wait for that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Leslie. Okay. So these are great questions if you are hiring an agency and also it's good to call you know a couple different agencies um so some things that we've already talked about 
Like, do you do background checks? How do you select your caregivers? Are they bonded? Are they employees? What type of training do you provide? Is there a charge for the assessment? And also um, a good question to ask, is there a weekly minimum? Most home care agencies will have at least 12 hours a week minimum, and most are at least four hour shifts. So you would do three days at four hours to meet, to meet that minimum 12 hour weekly if that, if that makes sense. Because a lot of times people think there are some agencies out there that don't have the minimums, but um, most of them do. So when you're talking to an agency, it's a good idea to have some type of schedule in mind that when you think you'll need the help. And uh, for us, we don't we don't charge more for on the weekends or in the evenings. So, um, and then it also is good to know anytime a caregiver works over eight hours, it's considered overtime, which would be time and a half. So let's say somebody would need 24 hour care, like seven days a week, we can do that as well. But what we would do is we would find three caregivers to work each the eight hours. So then there wouldn't be the overtime. And uh, again, one more time, Leslie, you said that the, the minimum for home instead, and again, we're just talking about home instead in this right. particular case, the minimum for home instead is three days a week for four hours a day or the minimum is 12 hours so could you do two days a week for That's six it. hours mm -hmm. okay. definitely all right. yeah all right so so the minimum is 12 hours however it spreads out right right and then too just to let you know when you would sign a service agreement it's not like you're signing a year contract so Basically, if the schedule needs to change, so let's say the day of the week or the time period, you're not locked into what you um, talk about when you first sign on. So, and also if you need to add care, we can do that as well. So I don't want people to think that once you sign that service agreement, that's the schedule that you're locked into. Okay, and um, I seem to remember in the old days yeah. <laughs> um, that there was like a um, sort of a get me ready to get going in the morning, you know, quote unquote package. And then there was a get me ready to go to bed sort of package. Is that, you know, like please come help me for two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening sort of a thing. Does that still exist or? No? Mm, we don't do a split by the wayside. shift like that. Mm -mm. Okay. All right. It's probably and, gone by the wayside. Yeah. And a lot of times why there are the minimums, it's because in order for a caregiver, um, you know, financially and time efficiency, that's why we require that four hours. Yeah, minimum, understand. So. Yeah, understand. Um, what about, um, can you say what home instead uh, charges per hour? Sure. I think, is that in my next? That's a oh, great good. transition. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. So most full service agencies uh, are between what we're finding now is 35 to 38, and that's what Home Instead, that's currently our, way, our rate. Sometimes in different areas, it could be a little bit less or a little bit more. So, and the range is determined, usually people who need more hands-on care or um, are advanced dementia, Alzheimer's, things like that, that'll probably be at that 37 or 38 per hour. 
as compared to if somebody just needs, you know, help with, let's say, meal prep or housekeeping, um, maybe some companionship, then that would tend to be on the less expensive side. And what happens is when you have that client consult, the care manager will determine what your rate will be. And could there be a combination, so say, um, say you want somebody uh, three days a week for that four hour minimum, and um, one day you'd like somebody to do uh, walking or exercise or maybe even help with speech therapy, uh, but the other days you might uh, not want that sort of level of care and it would be fine just to have somebody do meal prep and what have you. So then in that case, there might be a two different aids with a different charge, associated hourly charge. Uh, usually we do just a determine uh, one rate. We don't have like different okay. rates for different. Okay, rates. I got mm -hmm. it. All right. Yeah. And then two, to let you know, we bring what's called a client binder to the residence. And in the binder, it has the individual care plan. So, and an assessment as well. So that the caregiver will know exactly you know what services are required throughout the shift and also we have a section that are log notes so the caregiver will record during each shift what has happened so that way loved ones or friends are always able to see that and are aware of what's being done and why we do that another reason that we have that too is because let's say your regular caregiver gets ill or has an emergency and we have to send a replacement, they're always given the information prior to starting the shift. But then again, it's there at the residence. So it's known what exactly is needed for that client. And is there always an effort made or generally an effort made to uh, have the same caregivers show up if it's different days of the week? Is that the priority? Yes, definitely. And a lot of times though, sometimes even if with the 12 hour minimum, weekly minimum, we'll have two caregivers. And that's because it's beneficial because that way there's two people that are going to be familiar with your needs. And so if someone gets sick, has an emergency, then there's somebody else who's familiar with the requirements and then, and availability too. So the caregivers that we have, we have right now, we have 85 caregivers on our roster, but they all have different availabilities. Some, you know, are working part-time, some are working full-time, some prefer evening, or overnight or daytime. So uh, we have just a varied schedules for the caregivers. Okay, and we have a couple of questions have come in about uh, copies of Leslie's slides and in particular, that very good list uh, from the previous slide of the process of hiring an agency and those good questions to ask. Sure. And uh, Leslie's uh, said we can share the PDF of her. We'll convert it to a PowerPoint to PDF and we'll figure out some place uh, to post that. And um, we will uh, we'll probably just email everybody that was um, that we invited to this uh, webinar and we'll email a link to that. And then we'll also just go ahead and type up those those list of good questions to ask. Uh, an agency because they're they're great questions. So we'll we'll send that to everybody. And I'm pretty sure I have a PDF of those questions, so I could just send you that document. Perfect. Robin, and that sounds perfect. Thanks, Lizzie. So yeah. yeah, and then also at the end there'll be my contact information, so people can always 
contact me if they need anything. Sounds good. So we had talked a little bit about this, what's our interviewing and screening process. So we do the criminal national background checks, DMV, sex offender, we fingerprint, we do a drug test, we do a TB test, and all of everyone is bonded and insured. And then we talked about to the different trainings that we have on different topics and that the caregivers are actually employees of home instead. And then here's just some information about our franchise. We were founded in 1997. We have over a thousand clients and uh, currently we have nine staff members. Community Outreach, Michelle Rogers, who is the franchise owner, she's served on a lot of different boards for either nonprofits or um, community agencies. And there is a, it's called Community Services Agency that we actually donate uh, our caregiving hours to that agency. So, and Michelle's also highly involved on a, a federal as well as a state level. She's always up to date or participating, um, talking, you know, to senators or policymakers and things like that. So she's highly involved. We also do something at the holiday time and it's called Be a Santa to a Senior where we um, give, usually it's over 500 gifts to seniors in need. So we work with local skilled nursing and senior centers and also uh, CSA, the community services agencies. So it's a great way to give back to the community. And then we're known as a trusted local committed resource. And like I said, that we're highly involved in the community and we provide non-medical care for seniors. And we are nationwide. So, but each franchise is individually owned and has a certain territory. So the office I work out of, our physical office is in Sunnyvale and our territory is Sunnyvale all the way up to Belmont. But if for any reason, if you would call an office and it wouldn't be in the territory, uh, we, we work together and we could transfer you and get you to the right person. And then, like I said, here's my contact information. So if you have any further questions, let me know. And there's a few other things I'm gonna go over, but does anybody have any other questions right now? I don't see anything right now, so okay. keep it going. <laughs> so let me go let's see. I'm gonna close the PowerPoint. So when Robin earlier you were talking about what are we doing for COVID? So we are providing PPE to our caregivers. So that includes masks, gloves, sanitizers. Also, um, we can provide services in the assisted living. So sometimes they're requiring gowns or face shields. Um, we would just do companionship or preventing or helping with preventing fall risks, but we don't do personal care at the assisted living because they have their own caregivers that do that. But here's just like a snapshot that shows what our conference room looks like now. Hope everybody can see that. Yeah. So um, it's pretty impressive. 
And then two, 90% of our staff has currently been vaccinated. Oh, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then also we have at our office a partnership with a testing site so we can do uh, on-site testing at our office and then we send out uh, the test and then we get the results too. So, and that's something that we've been able to go and test clients to. So do you, do you always test clients or do you, do you always test your aides or what? So we're, we, we're in, we highly encourage our caregivers to be tested and get vaccinated, but at this point in time, we can't mandate it. And what, do, so what do you have the testing for? Is it testing for AIDS? Yeah. So if let's say somebody's, you know, not feeling well or coming down with symptoms and so, yeah, they can I see. Great. come to our office to get the test done. And we have a question about what is the turnover rate and the average length of engagement? For our caregivers, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think the turnover rate is for your caregivers. Okay. And maybe the average length of engagement is per client. Okay. So um, our turnover rate, we're actually, we're pretty lucky in that respect. I think our turnover rate is maybe, I want to say like 30 or maybe 35%, which in this industry, that's pretty low. And as far as we have caregivers that are coming on all the time, um, and that's just because too, like a lot of times a caregiver will, it could be a second career for someone that they have cared for a loved one or a friend and they find that they enjoy it and they want to help other people or they're retired and they're looking for something to do after retirement. So there's all kinds of different, and some are going to school to like nursing school or CNA or some sort of medical school. So a lot of times um, they will care give when they're going through the school process. And then, you know, once they complete, then they move on to other things. So there's just a whole different variety of caregivers and their experiences or what leads them to this profession. And also we've had some, I think our longest caregiver has been on staff for 16 years. So wow, long time. have been with us for a really long time. And how about the, for clients, do you have an average amount of time that clients stay, stay as your clients? It kind of all depends because sometimes uh, sometimes we'll come in and help clients that are on hospice. So, you know, that could be a shorter time period or we've had clients that who are independent and then, you know, they can stay with us for 10 plus years. So then we're just helping them through that process. So it just, it all kind of depends. Okay, very good. And we, it, it, this is not a question, but one of our group members uh, with Parkinson's disease, we uh, recommended Home Instead to her um, a few months ago. And she says, I'm very happy with their service 12 hours a week and with my caregiver. Thank you for the recommendation. Oh, so great. Just one happy Parkinson's client. <laughs> Love to hear that. You know, yeah, very sweet. Um, okay, and are you going to do 24 7 mm -hmm. or 40 70 rather? Okay. Yeah, and then we'll move on to Corey.
Are you seeing that or no? No. Okay, let me. Oh, there it is. How about now? Yep, seeing it now. Okay, okay. So this is something too that Robin, you can distribute. Um, so basically this is an action plan for successful aging. And Home Instead has put together this document. It's really about how to start having those conversations with family about what are your wishes as far as it can be financial, health, having a plan like, do you want to stay at home? Um, what do you want? Would you prefer a family member when a family member maybe can't provide that care than having in-home care or then also uh, looking at assisted living and things like that. So I'm not going to go through the whole guide, but what's great and just to to do the 40-70 rule or the 70-40 rule. It's basically, if someone is approaching the age of 40, then there's a good chance that a loved one is probably at the age of 70. And that's a good time to start having those, these conversations about your wishes so that everybody's on board instead of waiting so long when maybe a loved one wouldn't have the ability to, to express what they want, uh, what, as well as like having legal documents in place too. So power of attorney. So if somebody uh, isn't capable of making decisions that, you know, it's been laid out what their wishes are and who are the people to take care of those things. So for each of the subjects that were here in the content, so the financial health relationships, driving and a life, it's something that we have determined as act. So the A in act is assess, the C is consider, and the T is talk. So what this guide does, it goes through each of the topics and with those categories, access, consider, and talk. And also which great is it has at each section conversation tips. So how to start talking about these topics. And I asked uh, Leslie to to bring up this resource and, and we will share it as well I, because I've used it with my in-laws. I think it's a great, uh, great conversational guide to have with older people. And similarly, the um, people who are in their 70s or in the case of my in-laws in their 90s, they can have questions to know to to, or information that they know to share with us, the right. generation. Mm -hmm. uh, going backwards just a little bit, Leslie, uh, sure. I got a question about uh, what are home care aides who work for Home Instead not allowed to do? So there... Uh, you mean medically? Is that what the person? Yes, I, I think so. Yeah, okay. I think so. So um, one thing would be, okay, so taking blood pressure. So if they have the automated cuff, um, that's something the caregiver would be able to do and like report the number. But if it was a manual cuff, they couldn't do that. Um, if someone has a catheter, we can help with emptying the bag, but we can't remove it or do anything else. That would be someone who falls under the home health category that Corey's going to talk about. And how about but a condom catheter? You guys could remove that, I assume? Uh, usually we can't remove any catheters. Okay. All right. But, yeah. Um, and then, 
you know, we can't do any injections. We can't do any wound care. Uh, we can't even like put Neosporum on a wound because that's considered out of our scope. And I think you cannot fill pill containers. Is that right? Right. We talked about that at the beginning of the presentation. Right. We can actually, um, if there's a pill box that has been created by a loved one or a, a friend, we can remind them to take the medications, but we can't physically give them the medication. Okay. And can you open up the, say it's Monday noon pills. Can you open those up and you know, dump them in the hand, or is that not permissible? Uh, not permissible. Not permissible. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. It's all all good to know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then, if you, I mean, have specific questions, you can always ask during your client consult. Of course, we have a few more questions, but I think we should move on to Corey. And if we have a chance, uh, Leslie, will you stay around? And sure, I'd be happy ask. to. Okay, sounds good. All right. All right. I, I would like to introduce our next speaker is Corey Nina. She's with Emeticis. And we've had also, uh, like Home Instead, we've had Emeticis talk before. And one reason why I like to have, um, have Emeticis come talk is because they have therapists, physical therapists, um, occupational therapists, speech therapists, who are knowledgeable about Parkinson's disease. And this doesn't always happen that, that um, home health agencies have Parkinson's knowledgeable people. So this is a good thing. And I am trying to find Corey's, uh, Corey's presentation so she can um, give her presentation. And let's see, where is it on my computer? Oh, good heavens, I have way too many windows open, looks like. Um, let's see, can I do that? Yes. And um, I'm not sure you're seeing my screen though. Let me see, share screen again. Mm. I'm sorry, everybody. Corey, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Robin. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm looking for your <laughs> presentation. I loaded it on my machine. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. I just had to sc scroll down. And let me... Corey, do you see your presentation? Uh, yes, I do. Thank okay, you. very good. All right. Just let me know when we're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, very good. Okay, first I'd like to say thank you for Robin for inviting us to be part of this presentation. Um, my name is Corey Mina, I'm with Emeticis. I've been with Emeticis for about three years now. Uh, I've been in home health for about 10 years. So um, let me start off with letting you know what home health is about. So home health care provides skilled, now that's the key word is skilled, services for an illness or injury, um, wherever you call home, with the goal of helping you recover, regain your independence, and become as self-sufficient as possible. Emeticis Home Health offers um, services such as skilled nursing, um, an RN or an LVN, home health aids, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, social work and you know, some nutrition services also. Uh, we also offer specialized clinical programs that focus on empowering you, the patient, um, to manage your own illness and make good decisions. Robin, can you turn the next, the next slide, please? Um, yeah, there we go. So again, um, our services are, um, we have a registered nurse, an LVN, a physical therapy, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, a home health aide, and a social worker. So who is eligible for home health? 
So you may be you may be eligible to receive home health care under your Medicare benefits. So um, part of that is we need you to be have a skilled nursing need, a physical therapy need, or a speech therapy need. Um, you need to be under a physician's care. Um, all home health services has to be ordered by your doctor. Um, again, you also have to be homebound. Under the CARES Act, because of the pandemic, um, that homebound status is a little bit on the flexible side right now. And can you say what homebound means and doesn't mean? Okay, so it's in the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Robin, thank you. So um, here's who, what, who is considered homebound. Um, you're confined, you're at home due to an illness. Um, it is, it's, you don't have to be bed, bedridden, but, uh, but it has to be like a texting effort and that you need supportive device to, um, you know, to leave your residence. Um, a homebound status is not affected when the reason to leave the home is to receive medical treatment. And I think it used to be also that you could, um, homebound status was not affected if you wanted to go to church or a synagogue, um, something like Correct. that, didn't yes, affect the homebound status. Okay, that's that's true. And you can also go and get your hair done or go to a barber. Very good. <laughs> okay, so now who pays for home health? So under your Medicare, you're eligible, and it's covered a hundred percent by Medicare, meaning there is no copay. Um, and if you have a private insurance, um, some insurances are also covering, you know, home health care. Um, although some require that you meet your deductible. And um, so we would probably need to um, process your insurance to let you know what your copay is. Usually if it's a private insurance, there is a copay. Average copay is between 50 to about $100 per visit. And can you say what, um, what Medicare may, may not cover? What an example? It's a totally, it's a, Medicare covers for home health, mm -hmm. covers 100%. Okay, all right. So how do we go about if you wanted to have home health? This is what our referral process is. So you would need to go see your physician um, because we would need to get a face-to-face. -face. Uh, your physician then would write a prescription for the services that you need. Um, if you're in a hospital, the hospital can also make that referral for you um, as well as a skilled nursing facility um, can make that um, referral for home health. Um, also with Parkinson patients, your neurologist can also make that referral. What to expect for, for the initial visit. So on the first visit, a nurse or a therapist will be there to do an init initial assessment. Um, this will be a thorough interview and a professional assessment and part of of our coordinating approach to managing your overall health status. So our assessment focuses on identifying areas where you may benefit from education in self-care management and partners with your doctor to promote disease prevention. In addition, we also provide hands-on intervention, which includes um, you know, teaching the family or if there's a caregiver involved. Um, this team approach also helps to make the transition from the hospital or a skilled nursing facility to a home much easier. How often will the home health team visit? The frequency and type of home health visits and the services provided are based on your plan of care. So your doctor may change your plan of care um, increasing it or decreasing it, the number of visits, like for instance, how often a nurse will come into your home, uh, as well as a physical therapist. Um, our clinicians will do a custom care plan for each patient. 
And then we will also, you know, get your family members, your spouse or a caregiver uh, involved in the training or in, you know, in, in your overall care. Um, at that time too, the team will also do a home safety evaluation and make recommendations. An example is that of that is they'll see what's around your home and they'll say, oh, that rug shouldn't be there because there's, it could cause you to fall. So those are some type of safety evaluation or the shower, maybe you need, uh, you know, a grab bar. Um, so the, that is the time where they'll, they'll do that evaluation and make that recommendation. Um, one of our specialty um, program is what we call our fall reduction program. A little bit about it is um, it's based uh, on a clinical practices that um, we've looked at um, and it's backed by high quality care science. Um, it does the an interdisciplinary approach that gives you an access to a diverse team of professionals uh, from the physical therapist to the nurse to the um, occupational therapist. So it's, it's, it's an overall um, approach uh, to your care. Uh, we have expert in the home where 75% um, of falls do happen. Um, so we um, are aware of that and you know, we want to prevent that fall. Um, we also empower the patient um, to take an active role in preventing that, that fall. Um, what we also do is we have a fall detection system that we offer at no charge for about 120 days where it um, gives you kind of a peace of mind. It's a service where it's a, kind of like a necklace that you put around yourself where you can call in if, um, if you need help if, and, and if you, we, it could detect that you fell. Is this like Lifeline or something? Correct. Yes. Yeah, similar to that. Mm -hmm. And one uh, question, I just want to confirm, uh, in order to access this fall reduction program, which sounds fantastic, in order to access it, uh, again, the person would have to be homebound, have the usual qualifications for home health, have a face-to-face -face visit with their MD, and the MD would provide a home health referral. Correct, yes. And would the MD need to specifically mention the fall reduction program or is that something that a medicist can call the MD and say, oh, I think that the person would really benefit from our fall reduction program. Is it okay we provide that? It can go both ways. Um, we are normally, this is what our, a lot of our physical therapists are doing with current patients now. Because I think this would be of great benefit to people with Parkinson's disease where fall risk is uh, quite high. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Oh, let me see. I thought I picked. Oh, next page. Oh yeah, I'm trying. Thank you, Robin. Maybe my mouse isn't in the right place. There we go. Ah. There we are. So this is what the fall detection system looks like. So we're offering it for 120 days. We, we pay for that service. And then if you wanna continue with it, um, it's up to you. Uh, again, this is for patients that are at risk for falls. Um, and then, you know, they push the button and ask for help. Um, and then, and there's a trained professional that's on the other end and will, you know, report or find out what's happening. Again, this is kind of like an overall um, what we offer um, the patient uh, neurology patients. So from skilled nursing to physical therapy to occupational therapy to speech, and then also um, you know teaching that patient and what our nurses would do. Uh, and that's it. Any questions? And Corey, could you speak a little bit about uh, the PTs or OTs or speech therapists you have on staff who are knowledgeable about Parkinson's disease? Do you, do you have a few or at least one and, 
and to therapies can they provide? Right. We, we have a couple, all of our um, clinicians, our physical therapists, we actually have, we're one of the only home health care agencies that um, we have a full-time speech therapist that's been with us and has a number of years and is very familiar with Parkinson patients. Um, she participated in that big and loud program. So she is familiar with um, how to deal with, with, you know, the Parkinson patients, as well as our uh, physical therapist. He's also gone through that program and a number of years of um, experience. Great. And I just want to uh, make clear, and I, I want to confirm this with you as well, Corey, it's not that the uh, PT or speech therapist will be doing LSVT big or LSVT loud with the with the client, with the patient, is that because my feeling is that because they have taken LSVT big and LSVT loud, they know something about Parkinson's disease more as compared to the average PT or speech therapist who hasn't taken those kind of trainings. Would you agree with that? Yes, uh, yes, that's okay. correct. All right, very good. Um, okay, let's see what questions we have. Um, how much does it cost for each category of care by a medicist? Um, so if, if the patient has Medicare, it's 100% covered. Excellent. And, um, and then, as you said, if it's a private in uh, some other insurance, then there would be some copay and you indicated it was usually around a hundred dollars. Well, it's between, so if they've met their deductibles, depending, oh. everyone has different plans. So depending on their plan, um, some, if they've met their deductibles, uh, they don't have any copays, even okay, if they have a good. private insurance. Okay, I hope there's Medicare by the time I get to be that age. That <laughs> sounds like a Me good too, thing. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, as somebody asks, does homebound mean, for example, after you've had deep brain stimulation surgery, which is a kind of surgery that happens in Parkinson's disease, so you've had surgery and you're now at home recovering. Does that mean, does that qualify as homebound? Of course, if, if you know, homebound and right now under the CARES Act, homebound is very flexible. So meaning um, under Medicare guideline, um, it, it's, a, it's a taxing effort, meaning you, you can't go out, you can't go wandering around, you can't go, you know, on a vacation, um, that's kind of part of the reason why you can't go outpatient therapy. Right, okay. Um, yeah, the, the language about taxing is new to me. Uh, when my father used home health services, uh, it seemed like it was a little bit more strict. Right, like, like I said, right now, they're a little bit more flexible because of the pandemic. Right. Meaning, they, meaning Medicare. Uh, but I still want to confirm, um, you said on the slide that in order for the physician to provide a referral, the physician is required by Medicare to have a face-to-face? -face? Yes, meaning um, had either a televideo visit, you know, a telemedicine visit. Oh, okay. Since, you know, a lot right. of uh, patients aren't... Um, Great. are not, um, you know, seeing their, their physicians in person, but we do need to um, have that. So to justify why the need for services for physical therapy. Right. Okay. Um, let's see what, okay. Somebody asks exactly what does the assessment with the RN consist of with the patient, other than taking blood pressure, are your assessment nurses LVNs or RNs? So the that initial assessment, there's a list of questionnaires. Um, so for that initial assessment, it's it's an RN. An RN always starts the care for that patient. 
Um, and LVN would follow eventually later um, during the care. Right now in our Campbell office, we don't have an LVN. All of our nurses are RNs. So there's a certain questionnaire that they ask the patient and that's, and then, you know, of course they evaluate um, what the need of that patient is, what the goal of the patient is, and then they go from there. Right. Um, one um, question comes up and it's uh, a little bit related to some experience I had with my father in home health. And the uh -huh. health agency themselves was able to provide home care or aides that came in and they showered my father uh, as part of the home health uh, benefit. Is that, Correct. yes. Does yeah, that we, still exist? Correct, yes. Yeah. So we do have a home health aid that assists with, you know, the bathing, um, maybe with some ADLs, but we do offer that. Okay, and is that a part of the home health benefits such that Medicare would pay for that as long as home health is, um, is in place. Correct, yes. And, and it can't just be the standalone. It's not like the doctor can just order uh, a home health aid for, for bathing. Right. So it has to come with either a nurse or a physical therapist, uh, but yes, it is offered. Exactly. Okay. And then once uh, home health uh, ends, that would be then when somebody like a home instead could, uh, could provide the home care that the home health agency was providing. Correct. And or we work in conjunction. For right. The care at, for that at the same time. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Let me see if there are any other questions. Um, um, okay, I'm not exactly sure I understand the question, but I'll ask you anyway, Corey. Do, okay. Do they ask about ADLs and IADLs? Does that hmm. mean anything to you? Um, huh. ADLs is, you know, activities of daily living. Daily living. Uh, and I is instrumental activities of daily living. Right. Yeah. Hmm. I'm not sure. Maybe if the questioner can can re restate the question, that would be helpful. Okay, let's see. Do I have anything on chat? Those, that's all the Q and A. Where did my chat go? Oh, here's chat. Um, uh, one question for Leslie, if you are still there. You still there, Leslie? I am. Okay, great. One question for you is how much do the aides get paid? You indicated that the agency generally, a, char a full service agency generally charges 35 to $38 an hour. How much do the aides themselves receive? So it's all dependent on their experience, but um, we say that the average rate can be like up to twenty dollars per hour and that and then the agency uh you know is, will take care of and then that doesn't include like what the agency has to pay for their benefits and the overhead of that right and can you just briefly say what what benefits home instead provides to the aids because i think you guys are a little bit unusual in that regard as well so we have paid sick leave. We also have an employee assistance program. Um, we have 401k after they've worked a certain amount and vacation and then dental and medical if they if they work a certain amount of hours. Okay, very good. Um, Corey, I have another question for you. Okay. Is homebound an absolute criteria? Yes. Okay. And we talked about um, how that kind of is a little bit more loosely defined now with the CARES Act. Correct. Um, and then um, another question is, is an OT assessment covered by Medicare? Uh, yes. And at the moment, too, 
an OT now can do the start of care, but it can't be a standalone um, referral. So it has to be in conjunction with, has to be referred with a nurse or also with a physical therapist. Okay, and um, I'll give this question to you, Corey. I think it mostly applies to you. Is there anything such as long-term home health care? So I think the question is getting at how long can home health provide care in the home or provide therapies in the home? Okay, so... Um for, you know, like that, the skilled is a, a, a key word. So if we're done with their goal and there is no longer a skilled need, we need to discharge the patient. Okay. And um, I remember uh, there has been for a very long time, um, and uh, you may be aware of it, Corey, uh, kind of a controversy about whether if, when somebody, say with Parkinson's, is uh, receiving physical therapy, but they're not really improving, whether uh, Medicare will pay for that. Where do you know about that controversy? And right, because and there's only so much that you can do. Um, there's certain limitations of that patient. So with that, um, it would be there's, you know, there's only there's no longer a skilled need. So that's right. when we, we, we can't, you know, um, keep coming because Medicare won't pay for it. Right, okay, let me see uh, another question. Since Medicare pays, can a person with Parkinson's receive ongoing palliative care of physical therapy, even if they are not improving? And I think you kind of just answered that. So, yes, yeah. Um, let's see. Can skilled services be delivered by televisits? That's a good question. Uh, no. No. Okay. Medicare, it has to be hands on. Hands on. And what could you, like Leslie did, could you briefly explain what sort of COVID safety precautions the therapists and Nurses so, and home health Yeah, so similar to what Leslie, what they offer, we also have the, you know, the necessary PPE requirements um, where, you know, they have the mask, the gloves. Um, um, also what we do on a daily basis for our clinicians, um, they do a self-assessment and majority of our clinicians now have been vaccinated. Oh, that's terrific. Very good. Um, and uh, and also to let you know, Robin, throughout this entire, um, since last year, we've we've actually been, we've seen COVID patients in the home. Oh, wonderful. Wow, that's, that's terrific. And, and you've seen them in a, in, in a, somehow in a safe way. Correct, yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, that's great. Uh, Leslie, if you're still there, have you guys also seen COVID patients? Um, we haven't had any COVID patients, no. Wow, that's very lucky. And then too, I wanted to mention, um, our caregivers are required to wear the mask throughout their entire shift. So the client doesn't have to, but our caregivers are required to. Okay. And I would imagine you prefer the clients to, but, but it's not required. Yeah, it's up to them if they want to, but. Okay, yeah. and Corey, same thing for you? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, very good. Um, okay, I think we're, uh, we have a few more questions, but uh, I wanna be sensitive to the time and we're, we're over four o'clock now because my alarm just went off. <laughs> uh, so I want to reassure everyone that we will post. Corey, it's fine to post your slides as well, I assume? Yes. Okay, very good. So we will convert everything to PDF because not everybody has PowerPoint. So we will um, post Corey's slides, we'll post Leslie's slides. We will get from Leslie a PDF about the um, questions to ask a home, home care agency. 
And we also have the, uh, we'll post the 40-70-70-40 uh, pamphlet uh, from Home Instead. And, um, and I will send out an email to everyone who, who received an invitation. So if you're on the invitation list, you will receive that email as to where we find a place to post all that good information. And I would like to thank Corey Mina from Ameticis. Home. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And Robin, you can also include in there since in my presentation, I didn't have my cell number. You can, you can provide that cell number if they have any questions, they can always call me. Okay, sounds good. And I'll be sure that I have that. So, so that I have the right, why don't you just say also now what your cell number is, Corey? Okay, it's area code 408-472-4577. 4577, very good. And Thank you. post all that good information uh, to uh, some place we'll find on the Stanford website or maybe our Stanford blog site and we'll let everybody know. And I'd also like to thank Leslie Kiefer, our our other speaker from Home Instead. And also, Robin, I can provide uh, a document that outlines like medically what we can and can't do. So what oh, that'd be very helpful too. Thanks. There were a lot of questions about that. Yeah, yeah. I can do that too. Yeah. And then too, Robin, if you can stay on after, because I just wanted to chat with you for a minute. Absolutely. And um, so uh, we'll make sure that everybody here on the on the webinar has Corey's contact information and Leslie's contact information if you have follow-up questions. So thanks so much everyone for participating and we'll hopefully see you next month. We have a, a palliative care team coming to talk next month. So thanks so much. Appreciate everybody being here. Thanks, Thank everybody. you, Robin. And uh, we will share the recording as well. Thank you so much.